don't even need to introduce you. I'm a little Spinell, everyone. Um, so, you know, it's so funny. I Because we're a film school, I was going to ask you, like, the ultimate geeky film school question, which is about your aspect ratio, but I feel like everyone's asking you that. <laughs> no, I mean, look, it's always a really fun thing to talk about, I think, because mm -hmm. it's also really kind of nice to know that all of these things are, like, conversations that you can... You, me and Linus went to the um, to Saltburn, to the house, to have a look at it, and we shot lots of different... We shot lots of different aspect ratios, and we looked at everything, and it just became apparent quite early on that one three three was going to be the best way to, mm -hmm. to shoot the house. And also, you know, Barry... Um, uh, sorry, rather, Jacob and Archie are six foot five, so mm -hmm. there's a kind of practical consideration about shooting actors who are, you know, who are very, very tall. Um, but also it kind of felt to us that we were, all of our references for this movie were like paintings, but also portraits. So we were looking at Joshua Reynolds and Gainsborough mm -hmm. and Caravaggio. And so it works much better with the formal framing and with the super, super close-ups. Because really to go in that close, it's a film about detail, I think. And so in, it, in order to go really, really close so that we could see pores and stubble rash and, you know, um, taste buds and all of that, you you want to be as square a frame as you can be so that you're not seeing any background, you're just seeing face. So it kind of, it just, it's a process that it, it's whatever works best for mm -hmm. the movie, really. And so, um, and every day we were so glad we chose it because it just, it really unfolded itself as such a beautiful, beautiful way to shoot. Great, yeah, that's actually, I was gonna ask you about the close-ups because mm. I feel like this is a master class on how to use a close-up. And that decision was very clear early on of like when to go wide with your sort of tableaus of the property and the school and then when to go in close. So in that process of working with your DP, the amazing, amazing Linus Sandgren, who's incredible, what was that process like for you in terms of that pre-visualization or the planning of what the film was going to look like and specifically the close-ups? I mean, I think both Linus and I work in the same way, which is that we every decision has to be emotionally led, really. So every camera move and every setup, even if it feels incredibly artful or if it's sort of referencing kind of Nosferatu or it's, you know, whatever it is, even if it's tricksy, it needs to kind of have a human element and an emotional point of view. And, you know, you find a lot of it is you, you kind of, between yourselves, start to develop a visual language um, and so a lot of that is talking. And then it, it just becomes about what feels like it, it makes the most sense. And there are moments in this movie where you kind of need to be almost inside people. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have actors who are as kind of grotesquely talented as some of the actors that we have in this movie, I, I want to, you know, it's like magic. It is, a lot of it's like a magic trick and it's like close-up magic. You want to be in there especially with someone like Barry, um, because he's such a, so much of his power is in his silence and his stillness. Um, and so you want to get closer and it's amazing. The closer you get, the more enigmatic he is mm -hmm. even. It's like you almost know less the closer you go, which is so fascinating. And yeah, so it's, it's kind of, again, it's a process. We don't do any previs, neither of us. We want to, I, we're very, very, I'm very, very um, maniacal about detail and about um, the way that, you know, we, we present things, but none of us wants to be kind of tied to um, any particular shot mm -hmm. because so much of it is about planning, knowing exactly what you need to do, the kind of coverage you need to get, but having enough flexibility that it still feels alive, you know. That's great. I want to talk about your casting. Mm. So in the directing classes here, we talk a lot about how casting might be the most important part of directing. It's, you know, those decisions are going to completely change your film. So can you talk a little bit about your casting process? Like, how do you start? How do you do it? How do you know that that's the right actor? Um, I think it's, well, I don't, I don't write with a cast in mind, because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you're just, you're just always going to break your own heart and do that. <laughs> but um, 
I have a very long list of performers that I'm interested in, like, which sounds sort of creepy, but more that <laughs> somebody's done something. And it can be anything. It can be somebody that has a couple of lines in, like, CSI Miami. You often see someone, you think, That's a, that was a really interesting detailed choice. That was surprising. And so I always make a list of people that I kind of have in the back of my mind. And then um, with this movie, like with Promising a Woman, you know, I think very early on I knew I wanted Carrie to do that movie. And with this, I knew I wanted Barry to do it because, you know, Oliver needs the kind of vulnerability, the sort of vulnerability that you feel, that, the, that he needs to give you the feeling that Felix has, which is a kind of, he needs to give you the savior complex. He needs to make you want to kind of scoop him up and look after him. But then, of course, he also needs this incredibly dark mm -hmm. charisma and this kind of sex appeal that's sort of completely... I don't know, surprising and, and fascinating. And so, yeah, I'd seen Killing the Sacred Deer and I just... I was just going to bring that up. I, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, you think of, like, him in Banshees where he's just sort of this like, sweet, sweet character. And there's like, you see that in Oliver a little bit and yeah. the first part. And then Killing the Sacred Deer, which is the most incredibly menacing performance I've ever seen. It's just terrifying yeah. to kind of bring that in to this film. So, mm. I mean, I think that that was a, like a, a wonderful mm. balance of both of those, that range that he has. Totally. And so then when you have him, you know, and then of course, like Rosamond and Richard, I mean, they were just, they just had to be, I thought, I always thought Rosamond was just such a genius comic performer and, and, and Gone Girl is such a great dark comedy, but I don't think she got enough credit for mm -hmm. how funny her performance is there. Um, yeah, and so and so you do that, and then you you have an amazing casting director like Carmel Cochran, who who did this movie, who um, introduced me to Archie and Allison, who play Farley and Venetia, and they're just exceptional, you know. So it's always m a mixture of things, and then Jake, of course. I mean, I'd never seen any of his work. I just met him, um, and he's so funny and clever and perceptive, and and I think the thing, he's also kind of very keen observer of people. Mm -hmm. And he was the only person who came in when he came in to audition for Felix. He's the only person who understood that, as well as being incredibly charisma charismatic and charming and all the things he was, he was also kind of a boring dick. <laughs> and so, and, and you know, it was just so, he really made him a real person, which is very hard for a character like that. Mm -hmm. Felix is the toughest character in this because he's a kind of, you know, he's objectified by everyone, kind of. So it's trying to give him his own self to there. Yeah, no, I, I think one of the things that's remarkable about the performances, I think you have, you know, you have Barry's performance, you have, you know, these sort of, you know, bigger performances, but your side characters are sm like smaller characters, like, like John Reese, like the. I mean, it's just, or sorry, Paul Rees, like the, that performance of the butler, again, oh, yeah. speaking of menacing, is just so amazing. Yeah. And Rosamond, just what she does with your dialogue, which I also want to kind of dig into when we get to writing, is so great. And I don't know if you guys caught this in the credits, but Carrie Mulligan's character is Dear, is poor dear Pamela. Is it her actual name? It's, Which her, full, I think, it's her full name. It, I Pamela. think it's amazing, yes. Yeah. Um, but again, like to have Carrie play that kind of a role yeah. and and they're all just these sort of like bright stars being dampened by the environment in some ways in these yeah. like corners of, of rooms. It's just wonderful. <laughs> um, so going back to, to the characters, I think it's interesting. So much of the film is centered around this family and I, I do want to talk a little bit about your writing and how you wrote for each of those characters, both individually and then as a family unit. Because I think the dynamic between the characters and how they work together, um, like you're talking about how Felix could be hard to turn into a real character. I think somebody like Venetia is... I've, I've found to be one of the most empathetic characters in the film uh, in terms of how she feels. So when you were approaching this, obviously Saltburn is the place that they're going to, it's this centerpiece. What was your approach to the family dynamics when you were writing it? I'm always the worst person to talk to about writing because it all, it all happens in my head over years and years and years. And so I never really know how, I, I never really know how they appear or mm -hmm. at what stage exactly. But I think what generally happens is I kind of, yeah, I have an imaginary 
world that I go to a lot, you know, um, almost as much as the kind of real life that I lead sometimes. And these pe the people just kind of appear and sometimes people stay and persist and sometimes people go because they're not interesting but kind of bit by bit you understand you know you start with Oliver and then you know with Oliver the first thing there is is there's Felix and mm. then you look at Felix and then who his family might be and of course there's there's part of this which is also looking to the genre you know looking at the go-between looking at Bride's Head looking at Atonement those kinds of families mm. and there's usually a sister who's sort of sidelined there's usually a kind of glamorous mother there's it's it's that thing of um what are we familiar with mm -hmm. what do we expect when we get to a house like this in a film or a, or a book like this and then how do we um yeah how do we make them empathetic how do we make them real and how do we all I, you know for me it's always about making the audience complicit and it's not so much complicit in i don't know in in the obvious ways, but it's also like, I want to make sure that everyone would be delighted to be decimated by Rosamond. You know? <laughs> We'd all just let her do whatever she wants, right? And the same with Felix. And it's, it's just, it's important that we all get it, mm -hmm. why it's so compelling, why you'd want to stay and do anything to stay there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you know, related to the actors and your writing as well, I think one of the most rewarding things as a director when I'm working is I write something and then I cast someone and the vision I had for that character maybe remains in some way, but what the actor brings to it is incredibly exciting. Can you talk a little bit about how the characters changed in your mind when the actors embodied them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's not just actors as well. It's everything. It's every element of filmmaking. You, you kind of start with so much of like being a director is trying to explain the mad thing that's in here to you know the people who are going to make that real and of course the hope is that you, you're able to explain well enough that not only can they understand but they can make it even better and that's what's so thrilling and and absolutely with with actors like this you're just it's a constant gift and also you find I don't love rehearsal I, I think it um I think it can kind of lose some spontaneity, but what I do love is doing a bit of reading and with with the actors and then talking about stuff. And then you find that little specific things come out, little, you know, or, or you find that characters need to have more of a connection, that their, their specific relationship, you know, between the mother and the son or whatever it is, isn't kind of quite established enough. So you're kind of just getting into, you're just getting, it's just, you're just constantly at every stage trying to get deeper, 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 deeper. And mm. that's what's amazing about a really, um, a kind of a cast like this where they're all incredibly clever as well. They're incredibly astute and they're also maniacs. And I mean that in the most um, loving way because I think you all need to, in order to, in order to make something complicated and difficult and strange and arousing and repellent you all need to be willing to do stuff that you know lots of people maybe wouldn't feel comfortable doing so like yeah like I mean, trust and vulnerability has yeah, to be a part of that totally mm -hmm. how do you create that on the set like as a director um that environment where that can thrive fear cruelty <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's it's a lot of things. I think I think the first thing is, as I hope to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I'll always talk about, you know, if we're going to talk about what this film is about, I'm always going to be honest about, you know, the way I feel about things and that I think the drain is incredibly sexy and is supposed to be very sexy and all of that kind of stuff. So, like, people know that, I don't know, nobody feels, like, queasy about talking about things mm -hmm. is the first thing. But also, um, you know, we don't do... I, I, I think... I really, really, really feel strongly that if you go into making movies or doing any art form, really, but if you go into making movies, it's a collaborative process mm -hmm. and nobody's job is more important than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. So, you you know, we don't do swanky trailers. Everyone has the same kind of shit two-way. We don't um, 
relax at base. There's a, there's a green room that all of the actors have, whether they've got one line or they're the star. And they change in their changing room and they um, have makeup all redone there. So everyone is just part of it. We all eat lunch together. You know, we make an extra, extra effort on the production to, to put money into, you know, making the food really great and making proper tables that we can all sit at outside and having like a little kind of rec center so that when people are off that they don't have to be on their own marooned, you know, in a trailer or feel uncomfortable. So a lot of it is just that basic, honestly basic stuff that anyone in any office should be doing, which is making sure the people that are working with you feel comfortable and happy. And of course that, then you, you you have an intimacy coordinator for things that are more kind of specific and stuff, which is, I mean, the idea to me that people resist intimacy coordinators is insane because they are so fantastic. Our intimacy coordinator on this, Miriam, was just so amazing and just made it, you know, just made it so much more comfortable and possible. And, and I don't know, I think the idea that people used to make movies basically from like coercion and bullying essentially is so grim, mm -hmm. frankly. And so, um, yeah, it's, 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 for me, it's just, it's kind of basic human decency, mm -hmm. actually. But <laughs> having said that, I also, in all, for that to work, the other side of that is like, everyone works really hard. Yeah. And that, you know, and any amount of, I, I have a very finite amount of sympathy for like what I would describe as shenanigans. Um, you know, it, it also means that everyone has a responsibility to each other and that means to turn up on time to um, make sure that they've done their homework. You know, all of the stuff, all of the stuff, I like, I hope that there's a balance of like, this is gonna be really nice for all of us, but also if you're not showing up or you're fucking around, then, it's going to suck. It's not going to suck. I mean, like, what am I going to do? But right. I just, it's not, res I don't have any respect for that yeah. either. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so going back to your writing, even though you said I shouldn't <laughs> ask you, but I'm going to anyway. Um, in terms of your stories, how do you decide which story you want to tell? I really don't know. It Does just, just kind of come to you? Yeah. Like I think of, you follow it? Yeah, I think, but over years. So I usually have a few, I usually have, like everyone I'm sure, everyone here I'm sure, has daydreams or used to daydream or, you know, has the things that they think about when they fall asleep, whatever it is. Um, and so I usually have, there's usually a few things, a few places that I go. And you just kind of know the one you want to do next because it feels the most ready, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes it takes you by surprise. The, the next thing I'm doing is, hasn't been, mm, maybe hasn't been around for quite so long, but yeah, it's, it's, there's no, I wish I could say that I was a strategic thinker in that way. Like it just is the, 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 the next thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you feel like when you have a premise that you're following the characters around or you feel like you're working towards that premise? Like, do you feel like one comes before the other? I think it's generally, I mean, it's it's usually a few moments that then draw things in towards them and then, and characters, and then bit by bit you start to see patterns and you start, or, or you start to understand that, I don't know, something that you've been really thinking about. It's a bit like a dream, you know, mm -hmm. something you've been really thinking about during the day becomes this odd thing and it's only later that you make these sort of weird connections. Um, um, but yeah, I don't, it's, it's so, for such a long time, it's just, it's just moments and then it's people and then it's, and then suddenly, oh yes, okay, and that then this will lead to this and then, you know, you know that the karaoke scene is there, you know that the bathtub is there and these little fixed points start to, you know, it's almost like you've done the work for yourself in a weird way, like the, your brain is kind of, I don't know, drawing, drawing lines. <laughs> Making connections. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. Um, your dialogue seems to me to be very specific to your, like, style, which <laughs> I think is really wonderful. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you write dialogue? Um, thank you. Uh, well, I think part of it, again, is, do, is not, is saving it until 
it's completely ready, not writing anything down until everything is finished in my mind. For me, the more redrafting that happens on paper, the less and less like real language mm. it feels. And it's the same with rehearsal. The more and more people rehearse, the more it's, I always think it's like chewing gum when you chew it too much and it just becomes this like weird slack mulch. <laughs> and that's kind of what, it, what happens for me is, is the moment you start to start fiddling with it, it just loses its immediacy. It has, you know, the way that we speak isn't perfect. So I try to, I try to be as specific as I possibly can in my head and then, and get to as close an approximation of everything as I can so that when I write it down, it's been drafted and redrafted, but it doesn't feel like it doesn't, it, it, it's still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite, and it's a difficult balance. And then of course, what you find is sometimes an actor will kind of read and you just think, oh no, actually that's not hitting. That's, that feels too grandiose or too metaphorical. That's just too, you know, or, or they wouldn't say that mm. or that word doesn't feel right for them. But really I do try and, yeah, I, I, I try not to overwork it mm -hmm. too and much. When you say that you don't put it down until it's ready, is, is, is there like, is that very close to when you're going into production usually or is it? Well, no, because I don't. Um, so, so the way I work is that I won't show anyone anything until the script. They would, they, nobody knows anything about the thing I'm working on until I give them the script. Okay. So I don't, and I don't have any kind of pre-deals with anyone. So what, what I do is I just write it and then I give it to my managers and agents and then they sort of say, okay, well this, you know, this feels like it would go well with this production, I mean, you know, whatever it is. So I don't, luckily... It, what it means is that when I'm, when I'm kind of ready, when it's ready, it's sort of close to a production draft anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of like then doing it. But yeah, no, I can't, if I have a deadline, if I know who I'm working with, and if, frankly, if they've already paid me the money, I immediately lose interest. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it's the same with all of you. You know, you have ideas and they're, they're so special and secret and exciting. And then you start talking about them and it feels so good to talk about them first. You're like, oh, I'm so clever. And then you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't have talked about it because it's kind of lost its, I don't know, it's lost its kind of whatever it is, the thing. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of learned for myself. And it's, really, and it's really difficult because obviously it means that you're having to write things on spec. Yeah. But it makes it much more freeing. I think if you like to, some people love, they love redrafting and people only want to redraft and rewrite and that, like that works for so many of the like amazing people that I know, um, but for me, I just don't want. You know, and you want minimal interference too. Mm -hmm. If you want to make a film like this, right. you kind of need people to know what they're getting into early on. You know, <laughs> you don't want to pitch them Saltburn, the kind of movie that it's sort of pretending to be, and then them to be like, "What the hell have you just delivered?" You know, <laughs> everyone needs to know <laughs> so that they're happy. Speaking of, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your tone and style, and then we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to be doing a Q&A, so if people want to line up at the mic in a little bit. Oh, wow. So two minutes. Ooh, it's very efficient. Like in Parks and Rec. Um, I want <laughs> to talk about your tone and style. I think that um, the audience, a lot of them have seen Promising Young, young Woman, and I think there's a there's a, there's some similarities between that film and this film, and, and I'm curious that, you know, it feels like an Emerald Fennell film. <laughs> uh, and like, what is it that you're interested in when you're approaching making a film? Because you know, we talk about, like when I talk to my directors, it's, there's usually a question that you're asking or that you want to be exploring. Um, what is that for you? What was that for you for this film? For this film, uh, for this film it was why are we, what is our relationship with the things that we want? And particularly now when we're kind of in this like, yeah, permanent state of self-inflicted desire and longing, looking at people, obsessively looking at people and things in their lives. And, um, and there's something so kind of sadomasochistic about it. And I, and I guess it felt, it felt like a really, yeah, especially post COVID as well, the idea of kind of touching people, not being allowed mm -hmm. to touch them the kind of voyeurism. Um, yeah, and so I think, 
I think that was the question is like, what do we do with all the wanting? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then there are kind of other considerations too, like how do you make yourself special? Like, how do you make yourself seen by something that doesn't want to see you, that isn't interested in you? And, you know, w with regards to, like, Promising a Woman, too, it's about kind of social structures, I guess, structures, mm -hmm. and how we break them, you know? And if we can, and what it does to us if we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's all of those things. But in general, it's also, you know, the more kind of fun stuff, which is the kind of tension between like disgust and desire and love and hate and all of the, you know, the, the things that the space between all of us, the kind of electric, electric space between all of us of like, what do I want? Mm -hmm. How am I going to get it? Mm -hmm. What do they want? How are they going to get it? Who am I, who am I today to get the thing that I need? You know, and, and, and it's just a constant, I don't know, it's, it's constantly interesting to me, like the way that we interact with each other and the way that we get what we want, and the way that we are, make ourselves listened to or seen or desired, you know, all of that stuff is, is kind of where it starts, I think. And it's, you know, basically just a little, still just a little goth. <laughs> like, you know, I, I just grew up reading a lot of poetry and a lot of, you know, romantic, gothic fiction, and I'm not sure that I ever got away from that feeling of, you know, if it's a romance, it's a horror. Oh, that's great. All right, um, I think we have a whole line of people wow. who want to ask questions. So you want to step on up to Hi. the mic? Hi. First off, I want to say congratulations on making such a bold and wild and entertaining movie. I had a really great time with it. Um, my question is a bit broad, but I'm curious for your progression between Promising Young Woman and now Saltburn. What is something you learned while directing Saltburn that you wish you knew while you were directing Promising Young Woman? Oh, man, it's such a good question. I think. I think that with Promising a Woman, I was pregnant. It was my first film. I was shooting in a country I'd never shot in before with a crew that I didn't know who were amazing, but that I didn't know. Um, and so, and because I had such a specific idea of what I wanted it to look and feel like, which maybe like now, of course, it doesn't seem like it's sort of, I don't know, kind of unusual or like revolutionary in any way. But at the time, trying to make a movie of that genre and make it look sort of girly I don't know, there was a lot of resistance, basically. And what it did was I think it made me quite defensive. Um, in general, it meant that I had trouble letting go, partly because I, I was so determined that in the unbelievably low budget and the short shooting time we had that it needed to be kind of beautiful and, and, and we couldn't just, yeah, we couldn't let anything slip. So I think I was just holding so tightly to the reins that I probably, you know, in hindsight maybe A, didn't have as much fun as I could have done, but also I couldn't be as collaborative as maybe I am naturally because I just needed to get it like down, <laughs> like literally needed to make the days. Um, and so I think a lot of, and I don't know whether it is a kind of female thing as well. I, I mean, I don't know, but just like the ability, the kind of, um, the, yeah, just, just letting yourself let go a little bit not immediately being like, I know better than you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, okay. So in, in terms of like when you're approaching scenes that are frankly amazing, like, you know, the period blood in the mouth and like making out and rubbing that all over your body, but also uh, like, you know, the obsessive moments of like licking the bath water and also even going so far as to have sex with someone's grave like it, when you're cultivating those moments on set like how do you approach those um topics like with your actors and then like how do you know as you are building that moment on screen um in in terms of like how long that moment goes because frankly, I love how far you've like you take it <laughs> in this. I think it works really well. So I'm just kind of wondering how. I don't know. Are you sitting in the back of the monitor, like going, "Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god," or <laughs> is it something I don't know? Where you're working out with your actors exactly, like what beat to hit when? Um, well, I think it's a lot of things. I think first it's in the script, and, and it, so it's a lot of talking. And firstly, it's it's going to Miriam, one of the first people I spoke to, is our intimacy coordinator. And I brought her into my office to show her 
Um, so, so firstly, a lot of a lot of the script. If there's any sex stuff in the script, I usually describe how it's going to be shot, mm -hmm. just to um, a because I think it's reassuring for the actors, but also it's a very important part. Usually, you know, like the Farley scene with Farley and Oliver, the fact that it's just in you know in that kind of two shot. Yeah, that close two shot in silhouette is important to the you know. So I, I like everyone to know early on the kind of way it's going to look, what it is going to feel like, and then I explain to Miriam why, you know, why it needs to be like mm -hmm. it is, and then she speaks to the actors and they talk about where they're comfortable, what they're comfortable with. So everyone feels at every stage that they can suggest something else and they're not going to be ridiculed, or they can mm -hmm. say no and that's going to be completely fine. They can even say no. After the movie's been shot, you know, that's the thing about consent is it's like an ongoing consideration. So there's that stuff. And then it's also about picking your collaborators. And honestly, working with Barry is just so, so wonderful because we like push each other every day. We are constantly pushing each other to be more, you know, bold and intense and honest. And um, so when it comes to something like the grave scene, um, to me, that was always a scene about grief and love and horror and what what we do in the like depths of despair. And so it is all of the things that it is that that it feels like, which is that it's awful and tragic and funny and bleak, and it's just a kind of human kind of moment. And you know, so when it when it comes to shooting something like that, obviously. In the script, I was I was a little bit more euphemistic. We were a little bit more euphemistic about, you know, what would happen. But but I think you know. But it was just a moment where you know, we kind of looked at each other, and Barry was like, "Shut down the set." I was like, "Yeah." Okay. <laughs> and nice. and you know, watching it was just like transcendent. I just thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, and and all the things you know that you describe. It was just fucking electric and so there was no way I was going to cut away from it and I also think cutting away is kind of boring and easy and it doesn't give you the feeling that you're supposed to give you know which is like this is uncomfortable this is kind of funny it is awful but also you're thinking where have I been at a moment of my life where I wouldn't want people to be watching me mm -hmm. where I'm kind of at my most human and pathetic and sublime and so yeah, it's, it's all of those things, and it's just, and, you know, you, you sit in the edit, and you watch it, and you work out where to cut it, and and then you, yeah, and you just fill, fill it in the room, too. Like, I love making movies for a theatre, because you feel yeah. when that <laughs> pressure starts getting applied. It's like, I always think it's like, squee <laughs> this is a horrible, by the way, I should say that this is not something I've ever done. But it's a little bit like, you know, putting your foot on a mouse or something until it squeaks. <laughs> you know, that's what it should feel like yeah. for all of us, you know, mm -hmm. to go to the movie theatre and like feel that moment when you squeak. That's like thrilling. Yeah. Especially if it's different for everyone. Yeah, you should have been in here when all that happened. It was really fun. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. That was such an amazing film. I was in the back screaming on the inside. <laughs> but I recently read Brideshead and you uh, mentioned it and I was wondering what it's like to write with an inspiration like that while also flipping it on its head. I mean it's so much fun. I think like looking at all of those it's really interesting when you see the kind of progression because this kind of country house movie or this the Oxford movie as well um, and, and book it starts with kind of Jude the Obscure, Thomas Hardy, Jude the Obscure, and then that is referenced in Brideshead, which is then referenced in The Go-Between, which is then referenced in Atonement, which is then referenced in you know, The Line of Beauty. So you have this like continuity of everyone kind of acknowledging the thing before, and it's so, and so it's always really fun where you're working in a genre that's like very specific and established. Um, and I think all of the, 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 what all of those things have in common um, is restraint, you know, it, the remains of the day, even all those Merchant Ivory movies, you know, they are all about restraint, about what's not said, about subtext. And so for me, it's like, well, how do we, what happens when we take those restraints off? Like, let's just let it loose and then see where that desire, where that like suppressed desire really goes. And that desire to like get in to a place that's never going to let you in. 
and what happened, you know, what happens. And of course, it's just like, it's scorched earth. And so it feels so fun, you know, to be able to take that very British, very prim thing and yeah, like mess it up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, so first of all, I wanna say um, the film was like so viscerally like pretty and like shocking and I loved it. Um, but my question is, what unique or specific ways did you prepare the actors to get into their roles or build chemistry with each other? Um, well, we decked out all of their trailers on the first day like it was 2006. <laughs> so everyone had, I mean, it's quite specific to Britain. I, I'm worried that we all had nuts. They all had like Nuts magazine, which was like a really tawdry, la what they called a lads mag, which really... Um, like flung you back to the terrible recent past, um, you know, and they all had their own like scent. So Felix um, smelt like Issy Miyake's Lure de Issy, which was a big hit at the time. And so his room, so Jacob and his room and the bathroom always smelt of Issy Miyake. And by the end, we were all like very triggered, um, you know, and so it's sort of just like everything it's about detail and attention to detail and that and that goes to talking about the characters but also like you know being attentive to the actors too and what they need and how they like to work and you you know you learn early on that like Rosamond loves to do the early takes because she doesn't like to rehearse very much she likes it to be her first instinct and then Barry loves to do the end because he really wants to kind of find it so that he's really like comfortable at the end so there's also a kind of just like practical side of working with actors that actually you need to be attentive to to make things run smoothly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, God, it's bright. Hi. Um, I really, I really love just the visual look of the film overall and how kind of the architecture really complemented like the one three three one ratio. I thought that was really cool. And my question is basically, how did you collaborate with your DP specifically regarding like how you visually you wanted the film to look and what your vision was for the film? Totally. I mean, I think the first thing that um, the first conversation that me and Linus had was that he said like, what is like what is the word you think of when you think of this movie? And I said vampire. And so, and he was like, okay, yeah, gotcha. And and so. <laughs> You know, it's about, at the beginning, it's about sharing images, it's about sharing references, whether they're, you know, as I say, paintings. Or I think often it's really helpful not to necessarily reference other movies because you find, you know, you get kind of, you can get a little bit too stuck in that rut. So you want to be looking at, like, Peter Greenaway and Merchant Ivory and, you know, um, Joseph Losey, all those people, but you don't want to be, like, stuck there. So we ended up taking, you know using all sorts of sorts of sources and then it is just daily reinforcing of the language daily pushing each other again to be better more imaginative more detailed you know um and and me and lena share a monitor which isn't that usual usually you have your own monitors mm -hmm. um but for for us it's like we both need to be there all the time so that we're so that we're kind of you know, thinking as one, and because of you know, I mean, you're making a movie for a reason. There are so many art forms that you can choose, but a movie is a very specific. You know, you can afford to be more expressionistic, and therefore, yeah, you every single shot, every single detail, everything that is on film forever needs to be a very specific decision, and so you need to, yeah, you need to just be in it together all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, first off, thank you for being here. I thought the movie was great. I thought it looked really great. And I just wanted to ask you, I noticed there's a lot of like variety in the lighting and the coloring. I wanted to ask, do you plan that ahead when you write the script? Or is that something you kind of come up with with the cinematographer? Like, what's your process for deciding on how to light the film? I mean, it's a kind of, again, you know, it's a combination of those two things. I think we always, I always knew it would be red, green, and brown. Because you know, when you look at these movies, that's that's where they tend to go, um, and so a lot of it was then looking not just at colour, for example, but at texture. So mahoganies and you know, how does light hit velvet versus silk? How does it hit um, 
you know, a crisp packet versus a Red Bull can. Like if we're lighting something like a sort of Caravaggio from the side and we're doing, using a lot of kind of silhouettes, what is the interesting thing that's going to reflect how is, yeah, how is, how are all of the textures of, a lot of the time, you know, we're using junk to kind of create something that looks incredibly beautiful. Um, and so when it comes to all of those decisions, it's, it's an ongoing process right from the get-go. Um, and, yeah, and, and, you know, there are moments in the movie, for example, where you want to be entirely front-lit, like when we go to Oliver's house. You know, we wanted that to look like um, a daytime soap, almost. You know, the most ordinary front light, basic framing, basic front lighting, you know, basic coverage. That's that's kind of where it's really exciting is you can, you know, once you establish your, your visual language, you can then kind of twist it a little bit to get where you want. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Vishal, I'm an editor. Uh, and uh, firstly, thank you so much for that amazing film. Uh, I thought that it tonally was so varied. There were so many moments where I wasn't sure whether to be whether to laugh or be horrified. Um, and I feel like that also reflected in the edit in a lot of ways, uh, that there were a lot of different uh, like ju juxtaposition of styles and tone in the edit. Like you had moments that were very chaotic, but then also those moments that were still where you're holding on the shot, especially when you want to make the audience feel uncomfortable. And I guess my question was, uh, what, what, what was your approach and thought process towards uh, the edit? Yeah, thank you. I mean, Victoria is just absolutely incredible, the editor, um, Victoria Boydell. And, and she, I think from, from the get-go, she has an even darker sense of humor than me. So I knew that that was always going to be important because when you're talking about tone and, and where, to, where to look away and where to stay, you need somebody who's, who's going to be willing to go as like, kind of dark as you are and uncomfortable as you are. And so therefore, it's, it's, it's again, there are, it's, it's always a kind of, you're kind of, you, you do your first pass and you do your early cuts and so you're trying to make sense of the whole thing. And then, and then it's sort of about pacing really um, and how, and when you, push the brakes and when you put your foot down on the accelerator and when you stop and I think that's kind of you know a bit like the camera work or any of any of it it's a kind of there's a choreography that you have to sort of get into you know sometimes you just feel oh my this has been you know the party for example is an exercise it just gets more and more and more relentless until then you know we have a moment of kind of still and quiet um, but you know it's often, it's not really until you get into test screenings that you start to feel when, you know, you've maybe pushed something a little too hard or you need to push even harder. It's, it's kind of, it's using fresh eyes occasionally too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so proud of you all. Those were great questions. <laughs> so good. Um, what's something this week that brought you joy? Something this week that brought me joy? Um, I went to, uh, I had a deep pan pizza last night, which I'd never had Wait, before. Wait, which one? Uh, well, everyone obviously here has got their own, like, opinions about where to go. We had to be somewhere near the music box theatre, and so it was um, Giord Giordano's. Oh. That's oh, my <laughs> Come on, guys. It's not a good one. Next it time was... you come, we'll get, that's like soup. It's like pizza soup. Yes, and it was absolutely delicious. Really? <laughs> That's all I want is like a molten hot bowl of pizza soup. Okay. Like it was well, then, perfect. Then you did perfect. I got a great T-shirt. I loved it. No, I've had. I mean, it's, and then I saw the Caravaggio exhibition at your. You kept saying today. that. I was like, oh. very, very briefly saw it today mm. just to go and have a look. So you all know, as the Paul students, you get to go to the Art Institute for free. It's across the street. Go see Caravaggio. It's so well, there aren't very many. There are only a couple. They've pat it's a bit of padding. Look, I don't want to, there is a bit of padding, but to see, it could, like, there are some real beauties in there. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. This thank is incredible. You. Let's get for it. Thank you so much. Thank you.